Hi, I'm RT. And I'm Tyler. And this is Custer & Wolf Building a Watch Company. Today, we're talking about the product revisions for Vortex American Artisan Series. We call them V1, V2, and V3. So do you want to call the product we made after Kickstarter version one, or is that like minimum viable product Kickstarter watch, and then we got into version one after we fulfilled those like, what, 60 from Kickstarter? I don't think it really matters too much. We, we can say if it was glued together like they were for the Kickstarter, yep. that's not version one. Um, yep. I mean, we had in version one, so we, we launched on Kickstarter in November of 2017, we we shipped the first Kickstarter watch. I mean, we, we, we recorded the Kickstarter video and launched on Kickstarter in, in 2014 um, and in like November. Mm -hmm. And then we, when did we ship? It was 2015, it was almost a year later, but when did we ship the first Kickstarter watch? It, it was sometime near the end of the year in 2015. I want to say like exactly October, sure. November, like it was a solid year that it took us from Kickstarter until shipping, which was more than we thought, but like, I think pretty normal for Kickstarter. Yeah. And I mean, for the product that we were trying to make, like, I think we did all right, honestly, uh, trying to 3D print an entire watch case without any post machining and make it all work was kind of a big task that we took on without much um, research going into it. Yeah. So somebody asked me about that on like a podcast I did because we were talking about the lawsuit. And when we got the we got the cease and desist from Swatch in like June or July of 2015, mm -hmm. which I had forgotten that like that started prior to us even shipping a single watch to exactly. a customer, you yeah. know? Um, so that just brought me back to like, oh shit, we were still trying to figure out how to make this thing. I mean, it took us all yeah. of 2015 to figure out how to make the product that we sold on Kickstarter. Um, right, I mean, that's why the lawsuit seemed like a joke. We're like, we don't <laughs> even sell anything. <laughs> we hardly <laughs> exist, sir. Like, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, that was, I mean, that was an interesting time for sure. But back then we were making what we called um, Revision A. Um, yeah, it was V1 Rev A, the yeah. closest thing to wearable art that we've made. <laughs> yes, yep. So <laughs> Farthest we, thing from a watch. That was the one that was, it was two piece sandwich case over top of each other, two screws on either side. You were putting silicon in there to make it mm -hmm. water resistant-ish kind of. Yep, the same stuff you would put on your boat. Yep. Um, yeah, I mean, we used, we used <laughs> a lot of marine products. Yeah. Because we also, because the, the cases were 3D printed and then we were using, um, that was back when we were using X1, remember? Mm -hmm. And the X1 material was um, a mixture of bronze and steel and the bronze would rust over time. So well, we had to like seal it, right? Actually, it's the opposite way around. Um, so how, does, how did it exactly work? So when they printed them, my understanding of that process, it yeah. was a binder jet process. Yep. So it was a mixture of, what was it? I don't know what the binder was, but they printed, I thought in steel, and then yeah. they poured, they like casted iron into it. Right, it's, it's a powder bed process. So they print it, but it's porous. Right. Um, and then that goes into a forge where molten bronze yep. would come in and burn out the binding material. Yes. Yep. So as you can imagine, this is not super accurate, not a super no. accurate way to do it. Um, the stuff we've done following that, which we'll talk about in version two, is all DMLS, direct metal laser sintering. Right. Um, but this process produced cases that, I mean, they were pre-patinaed and that helped and we yep. clear coated them, which also helped. Yeah. But they would definitely oxidize over time. Yep. Yeah. And they looked really cool but they were heavy. Um, and because of the porous structure, <laughs> I, I have a distinct memory of trying to drill holes, drill and tap those two holes in each side in the garage um, yeah, on that. a drill press that we bought at 
Harbor Freight. Harbor Freight. So we've we've come a long way. I think is what I'm getting at. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think you were trying to do aught eighty taps yes. in three D printed in binder jet process three D printed material with a Harbor Freight drill press. Yeah. So I very clearly remember that because yeah. it did not work well. So don't don't judge me. I went to Penn State and it took me five years to get through engineering school. <laughs> so, um, but we made it. At that time, Reve had it was yeah it was odd eighty screws to keep it together, and then the the band bar screws were triple out one twenty. If I'm saying that right, yeah, like really glass skinny. screw divided by two. Like you couldn't even find them. Really skinny, really long, and they were made from hate to see it heat treated copper alloy. Um, which is not stainless steel, for sure. <laughs> we were, we were I, ripping the heads off of them as we. Were I mean, I, I've killed ten of those on one watch before, just trying to put the straps on. Hundred percent. Not to mention, the drill wasn't straight, so we we're already fighting that. How many version one watches between like Rev A and Rev B? Like, how many two-piece case watches did we make before we transitioned to V two? It's not. I want to say somewhere around a hundred. That's what I'm going to say too, because we sold about 60 on Kickstarter mm -hmm. and it took us, I mean, we didn't ship the first one until about a year after mm -hmm. Kickstarter. And then I think it took us a solid year to make those 60 um, throughout most of 2016. And then we went to version two, I believe in 2017 ish, like we were working on it in 16, 17. Yep. Um, yeah, I know we were pillows. working on it before we moved into our current facility. So we were in Jessup Farms, Artisan Village, yep. and we were having parts machined by Jeff down in Loveland. Yep. Um, and it wasn't until after we moved into our current facility that we bought our mini mill and started yep. machining them ourselves. Yep. Um, but we've been making and refining V2 for at least three or four years now. Yeah, and V2 is we went from, from a two-piece case in version one to a single body, um, a single body case in in version two, with it's a main case and then a case back that screws on. The first version, or revision, I guess, of version two had a cam lock back, right? Yes. That's because we were trying to line up the back of the watch and have the engraving look nice. Yep. We wanted the tool ports to be in the same spot every single time. So that's yep. why we decided on a cam lock. The other option would have been screws to hold down the back. Yep. Um, but we decided on the cam lock. Yep. Um, so yeah, we went V1 Rev A and V1 Rev B. Rev B really just had thicker band bar screws. Yep. Um, and I don't think too much else. And basically the way that worked is both sides of that watch had a 3D printed insert in each side. Mm -hmm. So for a hunting versus an open face pocket watch. An open face pocket watch has the crown at 12 o'clock, a hunting has it at three o'clock. So we had to make two separate pairs yeah. of 3D printed parts for 16, 12 size, 14, and zero size at that time. We made a six size too. And they were pre-patinaed. Yeah, we made a six size too. So many mistakes. And they were pre-patinaed before they came to us. So yeah. we had to order hundreds and hundreds of parts just to make like the five watches that we needed to make because all of our orders were custom orders. We weren't building anything before we sold it. For sure. And yeah. those inserts that went inside those cases were also 3D printed yep. on our Formlabs machine back in the day. Rest in peace um, to Formlabs machine. And we would, <laughs> we would <laughs> go in. Yeah, I think I donated it. You donated it to the, to the um, museum. Yeah, Charles Charles River Museum yeah. of uh, Industry and Awesomeness, or whatever. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I love um, that place. But yeah, we would literally measure up every single movement and print a one-off insert for that case. And yeah. if it was bad, we'd go back and print another insert. Yep. And because we were using marine grade sealant, marine grade sealant. Um, every time we take it apart, we, we kind of had to rip it off and redo it. We should call it sealant. I think that's <laughs> that's really cool, actually. <laughs> it's a technical We're just term. Throwing some sealant in there. Um, so, and, and so, so I think you're describing the next bullet point we want to talk about, which is why we moved from version one to version two. I mean, the list is, yeah. is enormous, but it was it was um, the the weight of it because when you poured that bronze 
into the case, um, the, and the case had to be thick because we had to, had to have enough room for those screws yeah. and stuff. And the accuracy so, was low, low yeah. tolerance. So those V1 watches were were heavy. They weren't water resistant. It was, I mean, literally glued together. Incredibly difficult to build. But like when you think about it, that's the definition of minimum viable product. Like we we got through that. Customers still love those. I mean, the, the hundred that are still out there, we've gotten a couple back periodically for service. And I've actively tried to convince those customers to let us upgrade them to version two, what we do now and make it more water resistant and lighter and all that stuff. And they're like, especially the ones that have like their grandparents pocket watch in there. They're like, no, you're not touching this. This is like OG Vortec. They're like excited about it, Yeah, um, which is awesome. You know. I, you can't, you can't do like it's really hard to do that from like a branding standpoint. So, um, so that's cool. I feel great about that. And I mean, it's part of our story, right? It is. Yeah. Like we didn't start where we're at now. <laughs> we are not it's watchmakers. A... <laughs> we're barely engineers. <laughs> yeah. You have an engineering degree, but I make all of our stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't do any engineering, which you know I think after the the Harbor Freight drill press story, you could probably tell why. <laughs> and you know it's it's worked out i mean knock on wood like v2 has also had like lots of revisions but yeah. that's what we make now um and that's what we've made for the last few years all of our watch of the day watches have been what we call version two and will continue to be for a little while here um as we get into to version three um yeah i mean yeah to stick on v2 just for a second it was while V2 has changed significantly from when we started started making it to where we are now, which yeah. just kind of illustrates you're never done. You know, we can Constant always, iteration. always improve. Um, but a, a major inflection point, not only in that product, but in the business as a whole was purchasing that mini mill. Right. Once we had an accurate, reliable CNC machine in house, um, I mean, besides the fact that nobody knew how to use it. Yeah, <laughs> you figured it out. Yeah, <laughs> I, I used a lot of YouTube that year. But yeah. um, once we had the machine, it really opened our eyes to how much better everything could be. Right. So that's yeah. when we started machining our inserts out of Delrin. Yep. Um, and we were making them accurate enough that an Elgin 345 insert would work for more than one movement. Yep. Um, you know, everything just went up so significantly in quality and are able to control and are able to edit things before if we wanted to make a change it's like pulling teeth because now you have to communicate that down the line we're not good at making engineering drawings or um, making it clear what we want or need yeah um, and it was very difficult but once we had a machine in-house that i could say what if we did this and i could go and try that out this afternoon yeah that made our quality go up significantly. So then we started tweaking a lot of different things on V2, um, turning it into eventually what it is today. We should do like a whole episode about the mini mill. It'll be like a giant advertisement for yeah. Haas, but like, I love that machine. I mean, it has that, paid for itself so many times over. I mean, it was about 50 grand. Um, we paid for it monthly with Intec financing. And I think it came out to about 1300 a month and it could fit in your garage mm -hmm. um so just the perfect starter machine to learn all that stuff yeah and i don't remember how much we were paying per part from our machinist but it was more than our monthly payment for the machine yeah 100 we easily. instantly paid off that machine if you look at how much it cost per part just to make the case much less yeah inserts and all the other stuff you're mm -hmm. making so so what like in your mind because we're we're currently transitioning and it'll be a slow transition i think because we, we want to do we want to do the transition right this time and not have any lapse in in production um so as we transition to v3 um what what are the big features of v3 that you're excited about and, and what are you focused on now in the r d process yeah i mean there's quite a few things we for v3 um we truly designed every single part on that, redesigned it from the ground up. Yeah. Um, we took everything that we've learned over the past seven years um, or more and applied it and 
said there's no restrictions let's mm. if you want to do it if if we think it's going to improve the product let's explore it yep so we turned over pretty much every rock every every option that we could change and play with and and did that um, another thing is we were getting some of our turned parts from swiss omatic and montrose right that's basically an entire swiss turning business that makes awesome stuff um, but we now have the machinery to make everything in-house. So yeah. part of V3 is taking literally every single metal part that we have in that watch um, and taking it in-house. Yeah. And to play on what we were just talking about, now we can play with it. Now we right. can improve it. Now we can iterate it to make it perfect. Constantly. Um, and, I guess con of that is now we need a bunch more machines. Like we need the Swiss, right? That's coming. Well, these the new machines are really to keep up with some of our new projects. Yeah, for sure. But like, but they they do some of our new stuff does require a new level of accuracy. Yeah, that's that's what I was um, that's what I was thinking. Because we you could have figured out and you could totally figure out how to make all the parts on the machines we have. It's mm -hmm. just well, I think you said it was just going to make it easier to make like the screws and those little things, right? On the, yeah, I mean a Swiss machine is going to be somewhere in the realm of three to five times more accurate than what we're right. using and, yep. you know, five plus times faster. Yep. Um, it's just the right machine for the job. Yeah. Uh, so we got a, we got a Swiss and a five axis coming in. Yeah. Right? Both DMG. Yep. Um, but yeah, so one of the, the biggest things that you'll just see visually looking at V3, um, well, the, the a lot of the reasons that we did this redesign is there were limitations to V2. I kind of felt like we had taken it all the way. Right. Um, it was just about as good as it can get. And there were a couple things that I wanted to do that would include a pretty major redesigns. So at that yeah. point, I just kind of went for broke and said, we're just going to redesign everything and make this perfect. Yep. Um, but one of the huge differences between V2 and V3 is V2, every case is just about the same, depending on whether it's open face or hunting where we drill that hole uh, changes, but every case is the same. And then we make custom Delrin inserts for each different model of movement inside there. And it's a case movement insert case back sandwich yep. that goes together. Um, the V3 is now a three piece watch with each of these revisions. You'll actually kind of notice that we get closer and closer to making a conventional watch. Um, yeah. This, V3 resembles a conventional watch more than anything we've made yet because we're just getting better and better at everything we do. But the V3 case is three pieces, so it has a removable bezel. Um, and the reason that that's important is if we want to, if we need to adjust the hands on the watch or adjust the timekeeping, we can remove the front or the back. Yeah. Installation is better, dropping the movement in the front. We're using um, all metal surfaces to secure the movement. Yep. So we're using the main plate to drop that in the movement, whereas before we were actually squeezing the dial in the main plate together. Yep. And dial thicknesses vary um, both in condition and size. In general. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. From all the different movement manufacturers and dial manufacturers. I mean, they, they outsource dials. Mm -hmm. So yeah. yeah and we, we made the whole case tube assembly removable. Yep. So if you have an issue with the case tube, you don't have to completely take apart the watch to fix it. Yep. Um, you can just remove that case tube. Um, if there's a crystal issue, you just take the bezel off and fix your crystal and then put that bezel back on. Um, basically, every time we had to fix something on V2, the entire thing had to be disassembled. Yeah. But probably the biggest difference that we made with V3 to V2 is the manufacturing process. Yeah. Um, the work holding and the fixturing that we have set up for V3 is um, light years ahead of what we were doing for V2. Yeah. It's all palletized. It's all quick change. We have a bunch of interchangeable rock locks. So ball lock systems for individual collets that we need to finish different parts. That stuff is interchangeable and the whole pallet that comes off is interchangeable too. So we can make Every time we hit go on one of those pallets, we can make a case, a bezel, and a case back all at the same time. Yep. And right now I'm working on putting a second pallet in the machine. So each time we hit the button, we can make two bezels, two case backs, and two cases. Yep. Which lets us build these watches 
a lot more on demand and a lot more like customizable to each movement and to each size. And yeah, the way V2 the was set way. up, it took a bunch of time to set up each part. Yeah. So to set up the case, we had to set up the case and then we had to run enough cases to be good until the next time we run out of cases. Right. Yeah. Um, so we do a big run of cases, a big run of case backs. Um, basically, we're always running out of stuff. And yep. It takes a lot of effort to switch over, and when it's running good, you kind of want to keep running parts while it's running good because it's really hard to set up again. Yeah. With V3, everything's quick change and hit the go button. And because it's so easy to change everything out, now we can actually customize each and every individual case for both height and diameter um, for the specific movement, movement that's going to be inside of it. And the reason that's important is because that means we get rid of the Delrin insert, yep. which is a difficult part to get perfect. Um, we've added a bunch of probing. So our QA is almost meaningless at this point yeah. because the machine is checking every single important feature during the process. Mm -hmm. um, you know, every single little thing on this, on this product is different. Even down to the band bars, we're using um, torque screws instead of yep. flathead screwdrivers. Um, yeah, pressing yeah. the crystals. And right now you're making the 16 size V3, and we're going to keep making V2 for 12 size for a little while just so we can keep up with mm -hmm. watch the day production. And you're going to go from focused on 16 size to um, like we're relaunching the railroad edition, right? That's mm -hmm. your next next big one and, and start making those. And then um, what are your thoughts on like, if we wanna keep making six plus watches a week for watch of the day in 12 size, when do we make the switch into, into V3? I mean, like nine months from now, 12 months from now, like is it? I think know? a lot of it's gonna depend on the product itself because Basically, when we started this V3, we were planning on doing 12 size and 16 size at the same time, right. essentially. But as we got into 16 size V3, because we weren't building 16 size, so we decided to do that size first. Yep. Um, we realized that there was a lot of work left to be done. We discounted how much time we've had to perfect yeah. our V2 version and how much better it's gotten and we thought we were going to totally redesign and hit the ground running on day one. But, you know, not surprisingly, we had issues and we need to refine it and we need to perfect it. So we got a lot of the big things right, but we had to refine a lot of the really small things about V3 that we didn't think about in the design process. Yeah, that makes sense. And that's, I mean, the, the biggest question that I get in like the, the marketing and sales side of the business is like, why don't you just make more, you know, like if we're making we, we have been making five watches a week for a long time. Um, we're, we're just now going to six watches a week and our goal, you know, hopefully sometime this summer or something like that is we'll get to seven watches a week. But that's it. Like the, the current Vortec business as we all know it is going to be seven watches a week plus our convert your watch service where people send us their grandparents' pocket watches. That's highly custom. We do maybe 50 of those a year, you know, like one a week maybe. Um, plus the military edition. And that's pretty much it. I mean, that's, if you do that math, you're looking at 400, maybe 450 watches a year. Um, and that's a lot, like it's really hard to do all this stuff. And that's so- That's 400 or 450 one of a kind. One of a kind pieces of art that still tell time. Yep. <laughs> that are 100 yeah. years old on the inside that you have to custom make every single case. Yeah, we have to and everything for a it. different case for each individual movement model. Each yep. brand has multiple different models. Um, you know, the stem, we customize each time to be perfect. There's a lot of effort it's that goes into hard. building each one of these watches. And it's, it's an issue such that we can't buy our way out of it. No, you there's know, no It's, it's not like or... we just can go out and hire five people and build watches faster. Um, the nature of the product that we build is that it has a lot of limitations. Yep. And that's why it's worth it in the end, yep. because it's so hard to build that the end product is amazing. But um, we're, we're kind of in a, a sweet spot at, at the amount that we're building. So yeah, so that's like, you know, 400, 450 watches a year max, right? I mean, that's, that's pretty much 
that's pretty much all we can do with with the current Vortec business. Yeah, and I mean, it's a it's a pretty good number. Making one of a kind products is really hard. It takes a ton of time. It's frustrating a lot of times. You know, pocket watches have issues that um, come out of nowhere. You know, you can think about it as a car you restored that's 50 years old when if it hasn't run for 20 years and you restore it a lot of the small issues are going to come out of the woodwork that weren't necessarily obvious to you when you started that restoration project yeah um, so it can be really frustrating just for the people building the watches because it's not just a linear path forward it's not do that and then do that and then do that and result is perfect finished watch a lot of times they get to that perfect finished watch point they put it on our testers during our QA and something goes bad on the movement that didn't go bad before. We have an overbank or we have some hands change position or yep. you know any number of issues. Which is, you know, that's what you're getting at with the change to V3 is we we can conform to the, the problems that just always happen in restoration of these antique movements. We can get to just the dial or just the movement um, much easier and um, we can secure everything a lot better and and that's just a learning from making I mean you know if we, we made probably a hundred or so maybe 150 of those version one watches um, in our early days as a company and then when we started doing v2 until now um, we've averaged 400 to we've averaged about 400 watches a year mm -hmm. for you know four year four or five years so there's there's nearing you know we're definitely over 1500 we're probably closing in on 2000 total watches in the world um, mostly v2s and so now we'll get into v3 and you know like we talked about that's that's pretty much all vortic watch company can do um, and and that's okay like we're just we're hitting that top top mark and so that's why we're starting the show that's why we are building this building we're going to get into and make some some modern products and some new stuff which you guys will hear about soon. Um, we're super stoked about it. It's all the new machines we're, we're bringing in. Um, we're, we're building not just one now, but two at least watch companies. Um, it's it's going to be fun. And would you agree that our goal has kind of switched from manufacturing more watches with Vortec to just getting as good as possible at what we do? You know, just getting every single yeah. issue at, and being efficient and making the best watches we can make, not necessarily increasing production well if you remember our goal for 2020 prior to finding out that 2020 was going to be a pandemic here um, was to become the best in the world at what we do mm -hmm. and it's a little bit of a, a a joke in my mind because there's really not many people that do what we do but if we're going to do it I, we decided back then that we were we were going to do it the best um, mm -hmm. and that's that's what i think v3 represents and that's what this overall like quality over quantity for Vortec Watch Company and the American Artisan series, that's where that comes from. And so when we build another watch company and fully modern watches, they'll still be quality, but achieving quantity is a lot more feasible. And that's yeah. kind of the point. Um, I mean, everything we've talked about that makes the Artisan series difficult is surrounding movement. Yeah. And that's a problem we won't have with the modern watches hopefully <laughs> <laughs> and and it's also what makes um the american artist the american artisan series really cool like you know when customers buy that watch they know they're getting one of 400 to 450 watches a year um and one of at this point about 2,000 total watches in the world um and that's not a thing that happens much um except with micro brands like us mm -hmm. so um that's pretty cool and hopefully I mean, it seems like the customers think that's cool too because they keep buying them. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but hopefully that keeps up and and yeah, we'll just keep that focus on on quality and and keep going. Um, but I think you know I think next next episode we can give everyone an update on on the building um, and what's happening. There's a bunch of work getting done today, and maybe we can dive into some more specifics on like railroad edition and some of the other stuff we're working on. Um, so. What do you think? Does that sound cool? Good? Sounds like a plan. Cool. So that's it for this episode of Custer and Wolf Building a Watch Company. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can follow along and watch us on Instagram um, as we do all this cool stuff. 
And uh, if you want weekly updates from our email newsletter, check us out at vorticwatches.com. Um, you can sign up for our email newsletter there and uh, we'll send you all this Custer & Wolf uh, related content. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time.